Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And I know that for some of you, it's probably in the middle of the night. Uh, in case you don't know me, my name is Rampal Gill, and I'm delighted to welcome so many of you to our 11th Project and Community Workshop. We have a um, very exciting agenda planned for all of you this week. Just a quick reminder to attendees that this meeting is being recorded and that we aim to post the recording to the website by the next day. Uh, you'll all be muted throughout this session, but please feel free to submit your questions either here in the Zoom chat or on the dedicated Slack channel, which we'll post the um, name and links to here in the chat shortly. We'll be monitoring those and, question, and answering them at the end of the presentation. If you need any help at any time, please note that there is a PCW help channel on Slack. You can always contact us there, or you can also email me. I think most of you know me and have my email address. Finally, I would like to thank Noir Lab for sponsoring our use of the Zoom platform for this year's meeting. We do appreciate that very much. Now let's get this meeting kicked off. And for that, I'll hand you over to our director, Steve Kahn. Thanks very much, Rampal. And let me take this opportunity to welcome all of you to uh, this 11th uh, PCW, as Rampal said. Um, it is uh, unfortunately the second PCW that we've had to do remotely uh, due to the COVID situation, but we've, we've gotten all better at, at working in this framework. And uh, so hopefully this will be a successful event. Uh, next slide. Um, so let me just start with a few reminders. Um, all of you have agreed uh, in, in registering for this meeting to abide by our code of conduct. Um, let, let me just remind you that Ruben adheres to principles of kindness, trust, respect, and diversity and inclusion. Um, we want this to be a very open and uh, joyful uh, meeting for everybody involved. Um, and so we will not tolerate any form of discrimi discriminatory behavior on the basis of any characteristics of any individual. And in particular, we discourage bullying, talking over other people. So please try to be respectful of everybody. We have many, many participants where English is not their native language. Uh, and so let people finish their, their statements when they have comments and questions. If you do witness any form of uh, bullying, harassment, or aggression, um, our code of conduct indicates uh, how you should inform us of that. Next slide. Uh, uh, go back one, I think we, uh, this is it, yeah. So as Rampal mentioned, um, all talks are being recorded. Uh, we recognize that some people do not want to be recorded and your remedy for that is to um, use the mute button and the video mute. Uh, so then obviously you will not be picked up on part of the proceedings, but, uh, but just recognize that everything will be recorded and the videos will be posted. Um, we want to encourage you to use the, um, the icons uh, given at the bottom, uh, in particular for Slack questions. So we will be using the Slack channel as well as the Zoom channels to encourage questions. And if you indicate with a thumbs up those kinds of questions that you think are particularly pertinent or well warranted, uh, let us know because we'll be looking at that when we prioritize. And inevitably, we'll, we'll be running short on time in the questions and so we can only deal with a few of them. And please try to show your appreciation for all of the speakers and all the questioners and all of the participants, again, in a, in a supportive and collaborative way. Next slide. Uh, so as Rampal mentioned, this is our 11th uh, workshop. Um, we have per, more than 500 people registered, which is just truly um, fantastic. Um, we're, we're, we're grateful to see that the community is now heavily engaged with Ruben as we get closer to the start of operations. Um, we have people coming from time zones all over the world. So thank you to those of you who are dialing in at inappropriate hours. Um, we, we tend to uh, schedule these sessions in a framework which is convenient for the US time zones, but we appreciate everybody else participating. And in particular, we have participants from Australia, New Zealand, China, Japan, India, Korea, Hawaii, 
and more. So they're coming in in various different time frames. Next slide. Um, I think most of you now are familiar with our new logo and the new name after Vera Rubin. Um, the logo took us a while. It was a very uh, uh, useful process where we engaged all of our stakeholders on what aspects of the logo are important. And uh, this slide, which I won't go through, lays out you know some of the ideas that come that that lie behind the particular logo that we've chosen. But the main bottom line is you know stars to data. So that's what Ruben is all about, and that's what uh, our logo proudly represents. Next slide. And just a comment about the name, I think everybody is familiar that as of January 2020, we officially renamed what was formerly the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope to be the Vera Rubin Observatory. We did retain the LSST acronym. It now refers to the 10-year survey that we'll carry out with Rubin, which is the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. So you still hear the term LSST use, but it has a different meaning for each of the letters. And the one thing that this slide makes very clear is we do not want you to use VRO. That is unfortunately still propagating around the community and publications and things. Um, the, the proper name of the observatory is the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. If you want to shorten it, call it the Rubin Observatory, but please do not use the VRO acronym. We, we want to make sure that Vera's name is included in references to the project. Uh, next slide. Uh, we have also updated our mission statement um, from uh, what it had previously been and is highlighted here. It's uh, build a, a, a well-understood system that will produce an unprecedented astronomical data set for studies of the deep and dynamic universe, but also to make the data widely accessible to a diverse community of scientists and to engage the public to explore the universe with us. So that is now a key element of our mission. Next slide. And I just wanna call attention as well to our workplace culture advocates that have been in place for a while. Uh, they've been uh, working with the management of the project and with our uh, communication EPO groups uh, to roll out a workplace improvement plan that focuses on increasing diversity, uh, retention of key staff, and a general positive workplace culture. And that includes the wider community. We want to ensure that Ruben Engaging with Ruben is something that people feel comfortable with, no matter what their background is and where they come from. And these are the individuals who are our, our workplace culture advocates. Sandrine Thomas, who's the, uh, the telescope scientist. Richard Dubois at Slack, who is heading the data facility. Chuck Gessner, who's a, a head of safety. Andy Connolly, who's a simulation scientist and involved in uh, system engineering and sitcom. Uh, Carol Chirino down in Chile, who's our administrative manager, uh, and Felipe Dariuc, who's a senior electronics engineer in Chile. Uh, so please feel free to reach out to any of them if you're working with the project or engage with the project if you have concerns about workplace culture or positive suggestions for workplace culture. Next slide. Uh, so this is my last slide. Let me close with it. Um, for those of you who have not seen uh, the observatory in the last year and a half, which is most of you given the COVID restrictions, you'll notice it looks different. In particular, the dome is uh, essentially fully enclosed now. So it looks like a real telescope. Uh, and I like this picture because in contrast to a number of pictures that we posted for Ruben, it shows a clear cloud-free sky. Of course, that's important to astronomical observations and one of the reasons we chose the site. Uh, so let me stop there and I'll turn it over to Victor Krabendam, who's going to give you some information and an overview of the construction progress. Great. Thanks, Steve. And um, again, if there's anybody that doesn't know me, my name is Victor Krabendam. I am the project manager for the Rubin uh, Observatory Construction Project. Uh, also want to share my welcome with everybody. Uh, it's great to have uh, so many good participants uh, in our uh, 11th annual PCW. Uh, also extend our apologies that this has to be our second in a row for um, for being in per for being virtual. Uh, hopefully we can change that, um, but uh, I'm done making promises on that front. So uh, a great uh, agenda for the week, and uh, I have it up here on the on the display. But 
uh, really invite you to go to the website, engage with uh, the details of the agenda, look at uh, what we have in store for the week. I uh, wanted to point out a couple of specific items, including uh, even in the next session, just an intro to Ruben uh, is available to you. There's a, a nice talk on safety and Chuck is going to, uh, and his team are gonna talk about the commissioning update. All three of those really key. And unfortunately they run in parallel, but as Rampal had already mentioned, uh, these will all be recorded. These in, the information will all be available through the website. Uh, and so please uh, engage uh, even when you're conflicted on, on multiple items going on at the same time. Also wanted to point out that uh, there is an opportunity to uh, engage throughout the week on really scientific um, uh, activities. And you'll get a lot of opportunity to talk to the DM team um, and looking forward to how the science community can engage with the Rubin data. Uh, but also there are three sessions, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, uh, that give you an opportunity to hear directly from our site team. Uh, so there's a, a Chile Spanish talks. Um, there's sort of nine different talks scheduled for those three different sessions. So if you're interested in hearing directly from our team in the South, uh, those are usually um, really fun talks to, uh, to get a good insight. Also, uh, lightning stories are back. Um, and so on Tuesday morning and Wednesday morning, uh, please join early uh, because those lightning talks will be going on um, in a pre-recorded session, sort of 15 minutes before the plenaries start. So uh, come and uh, listen to these eight people uh, give us a little uh, rundown on um, who they are, how they participate in the project, uh, and some fun facts uh, from them directly. Also want to thank uh, Ji Wei Chang and uh, Elizabeth Krauss for uh, giving us a, a plenary on Thursday morning, uh, a keynote. And so please uh, join Thursday morning uh, to, to listen in uh, from, uh, from these guests um, on, on some important information on the science uh, with the Dark Energy Survey. And then lastly, let me point out that we have many sessions this week on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, the first three are, are, one is today, two of them are Wednesday. Uh, please join uh, and engage with us on, on this important topic. Also wanna point out that the, the, the sessions at the later part of the week they were by, um, they, there was a restricted number of people. So if you were um, lucky enough to be, uh, to have registered early and are on the list for the, thir the Thursday and Friday sessions, please do join because we were oversubscribed. Um, and so uh, your slot was, uh, was given uh, to you and we'd really like to make that the most valuable that we can. Uh, and so um, our, our thanks to the group for, for organizing that, um, Andreas and Federica. Uh, in particular. And, and so that's a, a good opportunity to engage um, on some learning on uh, anti-racism. Rampal already mentioned lots of ways to connect. Um, and so you'll see here on the screen uh, for each of the sessions, there's a way to um, get into engage with the, the session itself by Zoom. There's a link and then a, a Slack conversation exists for each one of the, uh, each one of the sessions. Uh, so you can join um, directly by Zoom and participate in the conversation that ensues usually much later than the actual session itself uh, by joining in the Slack channel and getting your questions and discussion going there. And then interacting uh, also again, uh, Rampal gave you a, a, a comment about this, um, but uh, just put it up here on the screen again. Uh, Slack is a great way to engage. We have a Twitter hashtag uh, that also is a great way to sort of have a nice ongoing conversations. The recordings will be there, the presentations are uploaded and other, uh, other material on the agenda page. And then I want to point out also at the end of the week, we do have a closeout session uh, that that closeout will start with a, uh, an opportunity for a, a quick wrap up of each of the individual sessions throughout the week uh, from the organizer. Uh, and then also an opportunity for us just to close out as a group um, the entire session with their entire uh, PCW uh, with some uh, opportunity to discuss how what went well, uh, what the next year holds, uh, and then a last opportunity for good uh, questions and engagement. So that's um, the details. And then a last comment about how to engage. We do have uh, some fun ways um, and some other uh, exciting ways to engage. And you see some, th some themes here uh, identified with some hashtags uh, for ways to 
uh, not just engage on the on the details and the technical the, the technical aspects of the project and of operations and and how to um, how to engage with the data, but also how to engage as a group as a community uh, for the project and the, the community at large. And so uh, there's some great uh, hashtags here, and so hopefully you can uh, engage with that as well, and we can have a, um, a try to bring a more personal feel uh, to this virtual meeting um, in a, in an intimate way. And so thanks to a, a great organizing committee once again, it takes a lot of work to put all this together. Um, and I thank uh, these individuals uh, in particular for their hard work in getting us set up for this, uh, for running it this week, um, and for making this a, a really great opportunity to engage as a project and as a community uh, all together as we, uh, we strive to make the best out of the Rubin Observatory uh, from right now and into the future. And then uh, a last comment also about uh, preparations. So the, we did set up a prep room. So if you are organizing a session and want to make sure that your, uh, your, your technology is working, please join uh, during uh, these hours. And thanks to these five people that have, uh, have offered to be there to check with you that your audio is working, that your video is working, and that uh, the Zoom uh, mechanics are all in place for you to run your session. So that's a, a quick last few comments about uh, the week and how we're set up to uh, make this the most efficient um, project community workshop that we could given the circumstances. And so now let me also breeze through and give you a sense of where we are uh, with the construction project itself. The organization chart uh, remains relatively unchanged. Um, if you're uh, wanting to scour through this and look at names in particular, I invite you to go to the website, look at it, uh, or download this, the, these slides. But the only real changes this, uh, this year are ones that I want to point out re regarding one departure, which was uh, Daniel Calabrese, who many of you may have known, was our, our, um, our business manager and was with the project for as long as we've been a project. Uh, he moved over to uh, the contracts department in Noir Lab, and so he no longer is uh, our, our business manager. And thanks to Veronica uh, Kennison, who stepped in and, and is helping a lot with uh, some more administrative activities. Uh, also wanted to point out that Giovanni Corvetto has been formally recognized as our safety coordinator lead uh, in Chile. And so now uh, has been doing that function for a while. Um, and is now formally uh, in that position. And so those are sort of two areas that are um, that have changed in the last year. Uh, and I also wanna point out that as you'll hear from, uh, particularly from Bob tomorrow as he gives an operations update, uh, and, you've, and, and if you hear any of our discussions on status, you hear uh, me in particular and the project in general talk about how we are engaging with operations and that construction and operations are working well together to plan for the smoothest possible transition, which is becoming particularly important as the schedules are changing and as the details of the end game for the project change uh, and the operations team is trying to get a foothold on how to, uh, to really get the, the operation started. And so this slide really points out to you uh, those people <clears throat> in our senior leadership team that are already engaged with very specific roles um, in helping uh, the operations team get started. And so I wanted to just take this opportunity to point out that this is uh, not just talk um, at, for a few of us doing, the, doing that uh, transition planning, but also uh, the details are being managed by many of the people uh, that work on construction uh, and have roles uh, leading into uh, operations. So Steve uh, showed you the great picture uh, of where we are today. Um, this is just a reminder of once upon a time, there was a day, there was a day when we didn't have COVID in our uh, vernacular, and this is what the project looked like. Um, and uh, it was a great building. Uh, and if you look closely, not just at the dome, there are so many details of the site that have changed in this, uh, in this year and a half. Uh, but, but as Steve pointed out, the real change is in the dome itself. Um, and that's just a real credit to the site team uh, for having been able to, to, to press on and make progress uh, during these difficult times. And what we found out that um, at that time in February of 2020, uh, we were a um, sort of a, a cheeky way of saying we were a very large freight train uh, moving down the tracks. We were going at about four and a half million dollars a month of, of earning value. Um, and we were looking at the last two years of a project. 
um, and we were really busy. Uh, the entire team was, uh, was really engaged and on all fronts uh, moving swiftly. Um, and at that time, we were about 81% complete and looking at, uh, if you look at sort of the graphic at the bottom right, we were looking at a early completion of May of 2022, as in eight months from now. Uh, that's what we were thinking we would be done. Uh, that was our early finish. We were obligated to be done at the end of 2022, uh, at, the, at the end of September. And so that's what we were looking at then. Uh, we had 27 months to go and, and everything was looking uh, challenging uh, for sure. We had technical issues, we had uh, budget issues, we had things that we were working, um, but things were looking uh, very uh, optimistic for a successful completion. Then uh, this little guy hit us, uh, hit all of you, hit everybody globally. I don't need to discuss that any further. Um, but even last year at this PCW, uh, we thought we were pretty well through it. We were looking at a start, a restart on the summit and, and getting people into more normal modes across the project. Uh, but that didn't, um, didn't really happen as we planned. Uh, we did get started and starting in September, things were looking, uh, we were able to get people back up to the site in a more regular way and teams really starting to make progress as opposed to simply just holding down the fort and keeping it protected uh, from winter. And so in the meantime, uh, across the project, uh, everybody has really, really engaged and have kept um, ourselves as safe as possible. We've, we've done like, every, like everybody else, like all of you, uh, been working from home, uh, been managing any site activities very carefully with uh, you, CEPP for us is the COVID exposure prevention plan uh, that is, is, exists uh, for every one of our sites. Um, and we have been able to manage both work and COVID protection as well as uh, regular industrial safety pretty well uh, over this last year and a half. I will say as a point of interest that we did have 10 people that regularly come to the site um, that did come down with COVID. Uh, our procedures for keeping people uh, separated in bubbles, um, the individual procedures for personal protection uh, were all in force and were successful in keeping those 10 people that had been on the site down to spreads of no more than one person uh, in three cases. Um, and the testing program that we have in place was able to detect three of those 10 cases uh, that were otherwise asymptomatic. And so we've really been working hard uh, to try to get uh, COVID safety, industrial safety, and any incidents as low as possible uh, and a great credit to the to the safety team and there's a talk uh, in the next session that actually goes through this in much more detail so throughout this year uh, in particular uh, i'll point out that there was a lot of work going on and a lot of success uh, in taking advantage of the opportunity to get a uh, to get a, a foothold in as much of the commissioning work in particular software software integration um, in getting uh, as much software work as we could uh, with the hardware itself uh, on the summit. And that's been a big theme. And you see a picture here on the left, top left uh, of just one of those sessions uh, where we were able to get uh, many people on uh, to, to be touching hardware and to be uh, on the site while there were many other software engineers working uh, remotely trying to, uh, to get that, uh, that, that going, that very important part going with software. Uh, development and with uh, commissioning integration. We've mentioned a couple of times the, the dome, getting it enclosed. That's been uh, a real thrust for, for, the, for the site team. And you see that that's been, uh, uh, been, been very successful uh, over the last year and a half. Year and a half. Um, then there's been a, a focus, you, you heard us talk about it at the community workshop last week, last year. Uh, even with COVID happening, we kept uh, our attention on our commissioning camera. Uh, which we shortened to ComCam, uh, which as a reminder is a, a single raft of nine of the same sensors that we use in the camera. And so we keeping that, proje that project going as best we could was a thrust. Um, and you see in the top image in the top right, the, one of those early commissioning activities or, or running the camera. Uh, it's shown again in the bottom right as being integrated on the summit into the hardware. Uh, with the uh, refrigeration pathfinder. So those have been particular areas of, of, of emphasis. Um, we were also in the last year in January able to finish what we had to abandon, which was the final integration of the, of the telescope structure. 
So the, the very first exercise that the telescope um, vendor did when they were able to get back to the summit uh, in January of this past year was to install this top end. If you look carefully, you can see a person on a man lift um, and you can actually see that the top end is not really connected just yet. Uh, so that picture comes in just as the, uh, the just as that operation was finishing up. And then again, there's a shout out to the absolutely the entire Rubin construction team. Um, we just show you this particular Zoom uh, image, but it really represents the entire team that's been busy um, getting their work done, moving Rubin construction forward in ways that we can't even see anymore. It's always, sometimes it's always hard to see um, because there's so much uh, software and electronics and lots of different things are going on in the background. But now that we're all virtual, it's even harder. And so I really wanna uh, put a shout out to the entire project team uh, for their diligent work this past year. So I just sort of run quickly through the, the major subsystems uh, and, and mention data management. There's, as I said earlier, there's lots of opportunities this week uh, to engage with the DM team on the Rubin Science platform, how to engage in it, how to get the data from it, how to uh, start working with it. Um, and, and that's a credit to the um, tremendous work they've done this year. Uh, I point out that uh, the, the data is also routinely flowing at this point. Um, early on, when we first uh, launched the science platform, there was uh, other data sets from other observatories and other, other surveys that were available that we were using as testing and that we're actually using um, to, to, to try some of the, the features out, uh, but also to even push some science. Uh, but since then, um, now that we have data streams really routinely flowing, uh, I want to point out in particular the auxiliary telescope. Auxiliary telescope uh, you saw in, in some of those early images is the 1.2 meter telescope in the sort of adjacent hill. That is an integral part of Rubin construction of the Rubin Observatory. And that, that facility has been up and running uh, for a while now. And we've also made that a, uh, an emphasis to keep running even during COVID um, so that we get at least a monthly engagement of a few nights of observation so that we can uh, not just be testing the hardware of, of the um, calibration telescope itself, but more, maybe more importantly, is the 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 processing of the data flowing from that um, from that facility from an instrument that also has a CCD in it that's that is uh, similar to um, the ones we, we use in the camera, and and so this has really been a remarkable and really a beneficial op, um, uh, opportunity uh, to really push some commissioning activities and some DM um, efforts with with real data. Uh, there's also a tremendous amount of data that's already in the catalog and is already there uh, for a lot of in-use testing. And um, the, that's, of course, what you can engage now with uh, when you go onto the, onto the platform. Uh, last year, there was a lot of question about our, um, our data facility and we had lots of discussion about NCSA, which is our construction uh, uh, site for the data facility. The operations team was talking about the um, a, a, an interim data facility on the cloud. We were engaged with the, uh, with the um, agencies on where exactly the US data facility was gonna be. You'll hear lots about that this week. Um, it's moving along quite well at this point. It's not even really um, a topic of discussion. Um, the DM team has a really well understood uh, plan and we're working well with operations on both the IDF and the USDF. And so uh, those three entities as well as the site itself as places where data are assimilated and processed and worked on is all really going quite well. And you'll hear about that this week from, from the DM team. So everything is moving along. Uh, there's a graph in the bottom right that gives you a little understanding or a little graphical view um, of the continuation of development of code um, and, and those uh, pipelines. Um, and then the last comment I'll make, and you'll hear much more about that uh, this week is the collaboration between the construction DM team and the, uh, the operations team that's forming. And it was the operations team that was responsible for the DP0 release uh, a month ago. And, but that's a coordinated effort and is um, a, a, a lot of work that went into that from both the construction and the operations team members. Camera work is also going um, really well at this point um, with the filters uh, in particular. All filter coatings have now been uh, have been applied, and so the coating of the six filters is now complete. Um, those those physical filters are now in various locations. Three of them at, at Slack, 
uh, two, maybe even the third um, is at, at Livermore for the actual integration of glass to frames. Um, and then one is potentially on, on its way uh, from the vendor to, to Livermore, though this is an active activity. Uh, but the real, the real notice here and the real milestone is the actual completion of those filters but with really good results. Uh, you, you recall that that was one of our biggest, that was a huge risk um, that is now retired. And so we're really happy that those filters are on their way. Camera integration itself at Slack is also progressing, uh, has suffered some uh, emerging issues. They've been working it in particular, some issues with refrigeration. Um, they have uh, altered their sequence on how to um, integrate so that they can still get to doing a full electro-optical testing. Um, but that did require some changes in the, in the process for putting the, uh, the camera together. Uh, did require some early work on refrigeration that was giving us some, some trouble, um, but uh, we look forward to having uh, achieved all of that and getting the, um, the focal plane cold again, uh, hopefully in the next week or two, so that we can get electro-optical testing uh, ongoing or going again and finished up uh, very soon to, sit, to, to get the good uh, calibration on that, uh, on that focal plane. So that's all working along. Um, I mentioned that there were some refrigeration issues. Uh, these are all being dealt with. We have an alternate system even in, uh, under design and early uh, development so that we can mitigate the risk uh, if any of the issues that we had seen um, in the very early version of the, of the refrigeration system. If any of those issues continue to plague us, uh, we do have an alternate that we're starting to work on uh, to make sure that that risk uh, has the least amount of impact as possible. Camera uh, has, the schedule has slipped uh, in all of this, but um, in all of our projections uh, for schedule, they do remain um, off of the critical path and still have some float. Uh, although tight, uh, they, they do not drive our current schedule. Telescope and site uh, has also been um, busily at work. You've seen some images now and some comments already about the work they've been doing since they, they restarted this last September. Uh, progressing really well on those things that have been mentioned, dome, the telescope mount, a lot of utility work to support uh, the telescope, uh, supporting that activity with ComCam, uh, the software, all these activities have really been um, a, at various times and throughout the focus um, because each of them has either a very direct bearing on our critical path or have uh, issues on, on risks that we wanted to mitigate as early as possible. Um, and so there's a lot of real uh, tight work and planning with commissioning and within the actual teams themselves to really try to address those issues, the, the, those items that pose the, the biggest technical or programmatic risks in our future. So all of that's been going well. Um, and again, I'll, uh, this, this slide points out software as being one of the teams that really took advantage um, of the opportunity. Uh, unfortunately, many of these things, um, again, reduce risk, but have not, don't have a direct impact right now on our schedule. Uh, the physical nature of putting things together, as we'll talk about in a minute, is really what drives the critical path. So many of these activities, uh, while excellent and really moving the project forward, uh, ultimately are driving risk down, not actually shortening schedule. EPO team is doing great. Um, they were able to while a little bit delayed, added a few more people, the last few people to their team uh, to really start to put out some of the content um, and have prototyped many of their, um, the particular the, the, the graphic here is their sky viewer. Uh, but I've also been able to engage with the community uh, on some of their formal education activities and getting those um, tested and um, getting the community engaged this, the, particularly the formal education community, to really um, look at what the products are, to engage with the team, and to give that final feedback. So there's many aspects that are going on um, in this area. They are scheduled to complete uh, a little bit later than planned, but not as late as the rest of the project. And so the EPO team is really focused on getting things delivered uh, by the end of fiscal year 2022, which is uh, 13 months from now. So all that's happening. Um, and also put out that, uh, as Steve mentioned, the visual identity, uh, since we've been able to resolve that, 
uh, that's really given the EPO team the green light to really put the final touches on many of the things that many of the products that they're working on. And then the, the sitcom team, I'm gonna uh, go through this uh, very briefly because the next session, uh, Chuck is gonna go uh, give a much more detailed um, input on or status on where we are uh, with sitcom. Uh, for those of you that are wondering, sitcom is system integration test and commissioning. Um, and that is really the end game where all of our major subsystems are coming together and almost everything we're doing is sitcom. Uh, as uh, you would imagine putting a complicated system like this together. Uh, that team has uh, been focused. Uh, they were the leads for ComCam. Uh, once it got out of Slack, um, have been uh, pushing that one forward. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I did mention Refrigeration Pathfinder. You'll hear a lot about that um, uh, because that's an integral part of the package that go to, gets mounted on the telescope with the commissioning camera so that we get both the opportunity to put um, uh, photons on the commissioning camera, as well as have a refrigeration system that's uh, being tested uh, on the telescope as early as possible. So all of these activities have been prioritized on the summit and in everything that we've been doing because of the benefit of just reducing the risks as, mo as, as, uh, as far as possible. And again, you'll hear uh, more about that from Chuck. Uh, and if you're conflicted because of the sessions that are going on, really, uh, um, once again, encourage you to look at the slides that will be posted, look at the, uh, the presentation that will be recorded and available, and then engage with the community. In particular, um, this was a, an opportunity, um, an announcement of opportunity that came out. We've been talking for years about how we can get the community engaged as soon as possible with actual Rubin data. And that will of course be through the commissioning team during the commissioning period. Uh, and so this announcement of opportunity lays out how we envision that that engagement can happen and how teams um, in the community that are otherwise not directly affiliated with construction can actually get involved. And so um, look for that conversation uh, in the next uh, in the next session. So uh, this um, rebaseline, the COVID has clearly hit um, it, as it has uh, all of you um, in ways of our daily life, but it has impacted the overall project. Uh, earlier this year, we embarked on doing what we called the rebaseline. And now I have to call it the rebaseline number one, uh, because as we worked through the rebaseline of the project and even reviewed it in June, uh, we were already seeing that the COVID uh, situation, particularly in Chile, was continuing to have significant impact on us. And so, What's important as we look through these slides and, and you hear us talk about uh, schedule forecasts, that there are many slides and many graphics that refer to rebaseline number one, which is where we thought we were. And I'll show you that in a moment. And then there's now our current rebaseline forecast, which is a little even later than this. So uh, just some, some sort of context as we, as we watch, walk through this. Um, you've, you've probably gathered that much from the conversation even so far, much of what we're talking about for the rebaseline is all about the critical path. There are a few items that we need to get finished, particularly the telescope mount assembly that goes into then commissioning activities, which gets us through to science verification um, at the end of SITCOM and then to our early completion. This is just a graphic to show at this point in time, the, the kinds of activities that we go through uh, sometimes working with the actual formal schedule is a more beneficial tool. Sometimes even things like this is a really better way for the team to, the technical team to engage in what is the sequence of operation? What things are, are relying on others? What can we do um, to move the overall efficiency up in the, in the, in the project forward? And so this is just to, a, just a, to, again, a visual to demonstrate that it's, that is when, what the focus has been. Um, on trying to get what is our path forward looking like now that we've been impacted in this way. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna get, go past this word slide. I'll invite you to go back and look at this again because really all of these words are demonstrated in these next slides uh, visually. So what you see here is um, just a very, very simplification of our last 27 months of, of pre-COVID, our critical path, which was very focused on uh, the top green line telescope mount assembly integration. That was gonna go forward. We were gonna get that done. 
then we were going to be into the purple bar, which is the sit the sitcom activities. Again, super simplification, but that those two main activities were really what drove our critical path and led to what was the pre-COVID 9 May of 2022 early completion. Then COVID hit. And the first thing that you see was we had a gap of 10, 10 months that immediately developed because that's the time that our critical path telescope mount vendor was offsite. And so by the time they got back in mid January, we had lost 10 months. When we re-looked at the schedule and engaged with that contractor and the work that needed to be done, we also realized that because of the momentum loss, the changes in some of the sequencing that was due to the various logistics issues, that even the work remaining was going to be two months longer than had been planned. And so just the telescope mount, immediately 12 months of delay. We also did the same with the sitcom team and said, now given the situation that we're on, we're starting, we'd have to sort of restart the ramp up there are some issues with uh, the way we now do business, the new normal. And we also recognize that there was a couple of tasks that were in our sitcom plan that were doable when we were a, uh, we had the momentum of the project going forward that we just did not feel um, the, the risk level on those activities just rose to a point where we just could not uh, plan it that way anymore. And so they also saw a two month delay. So well, right off the bat, uh, we were at 14 months uh, of, of delay. Also, um, after the telescope mount vendor arrived, um, there's an interesting th situation that's sort of developed, and, and I'm sure all of you have seen it, that while one continent might be going better, the next continent is going getting worse, uh, and that the, the, the pandemic has, has had a different cycle, uh, depending on where you are. And while we were starting to be uh, optimistic that things were going well, the telescope mount could get to the site, um, as soon as they did get there, we did recognize there were issues with one of their main suppliers. And so there was another two month delay that we were hit. HBS is our hydrostatic bearing system. That vendor could not come. We thought when this chart, when we started the rebaseline that we could get them there by clearly by mid June. That, that, was, that was considered to be a, a realistic uh, deadline. As I mentioned, our rebaseline number one was actually being conducted on the 15th of June that vendor wasn't there. So even as we were presenting this total 16 month delay, uh, we realized that um, this was already being impacted and that we were now having to start with rebaseline number two, version number two. Uh, so this was a 16 month extension. Our new date of completion at that time was 19 September, 2023. That was very nicely uh, associated with the end of the fiscal year. And we were moving forward on that basis. Now, as I mentioned, uh, that TN, this, this gap right here, uh, right at, as we had completed the rebaseline, was already in jeopardy. Uh, we believe that we now have this under control, this question mark about how much it's extended is about two and a half months. We think that the vendor is now on their way to Chile. Uh, they'll have to quarantine. And if we can get them on the site in our current plan uh, is to have them on site, I think the 26th of August. So we meet that date then this now gets, gets formalized uh, and becomes our new rebaseline. Uh, and when that happens, our current forecast for that is that this new, it's not gonna be a 16 month extension, but it's gonna be more like 19 months. Uh, we're losing about two and a half months. And so this was the old schedule, of our cartoon schedule. I'm gonna skip right past it because this is that, that, that dates that we were showing. And this is what the new one will be. Right now, we forecast that the project will be done about December, January of the 23-24 um, period. Uh, I've just put down January 24 uh, for simplicity as a, as a the mar mark of a quarter in the fiscal year. So early completion is now forecast because of all of the delays that we've suffered with COVID is now January of 2024. We still have um, about six months and we have a formal process for justifying that. But for, for talking purposes, that's probably another six months of schedule contingency. And therefore in July of 2024 would be our proposed late date. Now you'll hear from Bob and his justification for what he's planning, Bob Blum, um, what the operations team is now planning for their formal start, but I'll leave that conversation for Bob uh, tomorrow. But this is sort of very late breaking 
uh, we are trying to we're trying to formalize this and get our rebaseline done uh, as soon as possible. Now, uh, of course, uh, along with that, there is a cost, and essentially, uh, the best way that I can describe how the costs are impacting us is that yes, the schedule has gone on, and yes, we are com we are completing a lot of things, but there's no getting around the fact that. I need this team in place when we get to the end. Various milestones require this team. And therefore, whether they have completed their work uh, on their products and their activities early or not, they need to be on the construction team when we get to the final, uh, the final deliverables. And so it's really just an extension of the budget. It's a lot more complicated than that, but the budget extension is mostly about people and keeping the people in place. And so when we proposed uh, our first baseline, rebaseline, it was $42 million worth of primarily, again, labor. Um, and we had a justification for another $9 million in contingency. So that rebaseline request was $51 million. As distributed, as you might imagine, that the red parts in this graph um, are the new monies uh, in those different fiscal years. Uh, and everything sort of is at, at the end, you'll see some of the blue original budget was also pushed out into later years because we couldn't get it done. But this is essentially uh, how that, that those new monies were, were, uh, were, were requested and budgeted. Now, um, so that's where we were. That's where we are. Uh, the top section here is our first rebaseline. Uh, we were uh, developing that earlier this year when we thought we could get certain things done. Um, and this is just a very, very high level summary. At that time, Rebaseline version one was a 16 month delay. We were gonna now be completing in 19 uh, of September in 2023, and we had requested a total of $51 million. Um, and so uh, then there's the big however, again, this is the summary slide. Uh, however, those borders in Chile's did not open and we could not get that vendor into, into Chile. And so that is now this two and a half, three month extension um, and is likely to be another uh, $7 million worth of, of request. All of this is request, none of this is formal. Uh, we still have only one baseline uh, and we're working with our agencies to get this done. So um, right now, we, uh, we, you'll hear it, well, I'll stop saying it, uh, but project is being continued to get hit by COVID. Uh, we are continuing to have to fight through and figure out ways to get this built despite the complications. Um, but even as we do that, uh, we continue to be uh, positioned, we think, for success uh, on this new schedule and new budget. So that's the really quick version of the summary of where we stand. Uh, this is a great opportunity to show uh, the one thing that we love to hand out, uh, one of the things we love to hand out in a, in a PCW is our annual patch. And I'm uh, really happy to be able to show everybody this year's 2021 patch um, for, uh, for Ruben. And as I mentioned earlier, the importance of the, um, the auxiliary telescope, this is what's imaged here is in fact a picture of the auxiliary telescope uh, and wanting to point out that that activity has really been um, a shining, um, uh, I'll say it, been a shining star in our, uh, in our activities and really been really helpful in the team getting that done. So uh, last couple of pictures, this is just a close up uh, once again of that, act of that activity of putting the top end on the telescope. And I just what's really great about this is just the, the perspective of the size of the telescope with the person um, in orange uh, buckled in, in the man lift on the very top. And then uh, just from uh, just a week ago uh, or two weeks ago, this is another image looking, sort of getting a perspective of inside the dome um, and the need for lights now, which is also a great, uh, great milestone. And then another version of the site. And I think we have about 10 or 15 minutes or so for questions now. Uh, but again, I'll, I'll point out, we've got the Slack channel and we have people looking at that. We have people on the chat channel, on the Zoom, uh, looking at that. And if, um, if, if it's necessary, or if you feel, uh, you would rather do a, a verbal question, please just raise your hand using the Zoom feature and we'll try to call on you that way too. Thank you. Thank you, Victor and Steve. Great presentation. 
we do have 439 people on, but no questions yet on the Zoom channel, on the Zoom chat. Um, let me see if Melissa has any on the Slack chat. Or are we just facing Monday morning? No, great. Okay, yeah, go ahead, Melissa. Questions. People are breaking the ice. They're getting started. Yeah. So the first question from Slack: Is there a place where the rebaseline schedule, uh, rebaseline number two, is adopted, um, and other commissioning updates slash additional timeline shifts to be posted online? Do you have a place for that? Does it go online? Certainly, uh, this is late breaking, and, and because it's so dynamic, uh, we will we will make it a more of an announcement than just simply look at our website and find the data. The data is always there. Uh, we're always publishing what our schedules are, but we certainly take the opportunity to use our uh, either our biweekly uh, digest or direct messaging on what it, what the end game is looking like, particularly once. We have a rebaseline that um, that has been worked through with the with the agencies and that is on a path to success. Uh, but we absolutely recognize that everybody is waiting, and we are as anxious as everybody else uh, to be able to plan for how we get this done uh, and how we can get this uh, this this very cool facility in your hands. Did you want to continue on Zoom, Melissa? I was just going to post a response also on Slack to uh, point at the page, which we do try to keep updated as much as we can. So I'll be doing that shortly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I can continue. I have a, um, one really short one, just a refresher on the SITCOM acronym. Can you remind us what it stood for again? System, integration, test, and commissioning. Right, cool, okay. And then there's a question here on Slack that's getting lots of upvotes, and it's about the observatory energy source. Uh, where does the observatory energy come from and how much of it is renewable? Uh, is there any effort to estimate and reduce um, our carbon footprint? I will start to answer this and I will invite Bob Blum, if he's on, uh, to be ready to sort of maybe project forward. But right now, Ruben Construction has set up the power is a is from the uh, commercial uh, source in Chile, um, and we do not personally uh, or per personally as a project do not have renewable sources. Uh, we have gone through a lot of effort to make sure that we have a lot of power uh, storage um, on site so that we can reduce the load because of moving a 600 ton dome like we do in the telescope as fast as we do. Uh, we have at least worked out ways uh, to store energy there and to be able to handle that pickup. Um, and I'll just point out while Bob is getting ready to answer our, our, our plans going forward uh, and the work that's being done to look for ways to, to improve this. Um, but Chile itself uses a, uses a lot of um, uh, dams to get, um, to get power generation. Uh, and so a lot of it is already coming from uh, a renewable source. And then I think I've given you enough time, Bob, to th plan your answer. Thanks, Victor. So uh, this is definitely a topic that is uh, on the front of our mind as we go forward and planning for operations. In fact, with the entire Noir Lab program, how we operate in Chile, Arizona, and Hawaii, we are discussing actively right now ways to uh, significantly reduce our carbon footprint um, going forward. And that could involve installing more photovoltaic panels, uh, for example, in Chile already Gemini uses a significant amount of uh, electricity generated by their own uh, photovoltaic uh, systems. And we're looking at extending that to other facilities, including Rubin. We're taking a close look at uh, travel and we expect to reduce our travel significantly in the future. Uh, our U.S. data facility is being uh, constructed in a facility that is uh, quite green by national standards and um, is uh, uh, an exemplar of, of uh, efficient energy use. So we are looking at all possible ways uh, to reduce our carbon footprint going forward um, throughout our organizations. Okay, thank you very much, Bob. Uh, Chuck, I think you had your hand up for a second. There is a question on Zoom as well that I do want to get to. 
Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, Rand Powell, just a, a, a little bit about extra detail on our uh, energy footprint in that both the, the telescope and the dome uses uh, a regenerative uh, power system so that when we expend energy to move the uh, telescope or dome, uh, and then we uh, need to dissipate that energy to slow it down, much of that energy is regenerated, regenerated into our storage systems. And so it's not wasted. Um, and that's something relatively new to our, our, our observatory systems um, to date. So just wanted to point that out. Okay, thank you, Chuck. So the question on Zoom is about in-kind uh, proposals that have been made. Um, and is there a plan for how these timeline shifts will affect those in-kind proposals? Yeah, let, let me start on this and then pass it to Bob who will address it. I mean, obviously the nature of the in-kind uh, proposals varies considerably. So some elements of it were support for commissioning and that effort will be phased in, of course, as we uh, proceed with the timeline. Most of the other efforts were directed at software support in various different ways. And so extra time on that is useful, but um, let me turn it over to Bob for a more formal answer. So we are working right now actively with our operations team, our in-kind uh, program coordinators to work with all the um, uh, programs that are going through development right now to understand their FTE loading, their profiles, and we are um, right now, you know, trying to keep up with what's happening on the construction project to make sure those things lined up. Of course, a lot of the activity um, is somewhat independent of actually when the, the, the observing starts, not all of it is, but much of it is for software development and other things that can be done um, even as we wait for the construction project to finish. So yes, it's, it's something that we're working on actively and we will adapt as needed any programs that we're gonna have um, an early shift. If that doesn't make sense, we'll just work it to, to make sure that it comes out um, in the right way. Hey Bob, you want to introduce yourself since we've we've, <laughs> we've launched you into the we've launched you into the fray before your formal presentation tomorrow. But. Yeah, I'm Bob Blum. I'm the uh, Rubin Observatory Operations Director, leading the operations team. Um, I'm based in Tucson at Noir Lab, and um, glad to be here with you all. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Victor. All right, back to Melissa. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, um, there are two more questions on the Slack. One is about the COVID situation in Chile, but I'm just gonna hope that someone who's familiar with Chile goes in the, in the Slack and answers that question. And instead I'll bring up the second question. You mentioned that some data is already available. Uh, what kind of data is it? Is it open access to all astronomers and would it be useful for simulations and predictions? Bob, I think you should probably take that. <laughs> Uh, I'll just say, yeah, yes, it's simulated data, and yes, it's being uh, provided to um, a segment of our community. We're ramping up slowly, mostly uh, because of the load of supporting the community, and we'll talk all about it tomorrow at the operations uh, plenary. We call it Data Preview Zero, and it's, it's based on um, simulated data from the Dark Energy Science Collaboration that looks a lot like uh, the, the Rubin data will look eventually, but we'll, we'll talk about it tomorrow at the ops plenary. Maybe it looked we'll, like Will maybe wanted to add to that as well. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, Victor mentioned that data was available because we're taking data from, from Oxtel and from OnSky. That's not been made available to the community. It's for use internally for now. The first time you'll see some real data from uh, ComCam will be DP1, which is a little bit later when we actually have ComCam on Sky. All right, I think we have just hit the top of the hour. Thank you to everyone who presented, asked questions, everyone who joined the meeting today. This concludes the first plenary session, but please continue to interact with us on the dedicated Slack channel. We will get to answer your questions. This session recording will be posted on the workshop website, hopefully by tomorrow, like I said before. And now it's time for a break and there is a coffee break Slack channel. 
And there is a Zoom ID that you can use in case you want to go and have a chat with someone um, that's there for you to use. And we will be back at 10.30 Pacific Daylight Time with the breakout sessions. Uh, check the agenda for the correct Zoom links. If you need any help, go to the Slack channel for help. And look out for announcements on the announcement channel. There's lots of important information appearing on there throughout the day. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everybody.